Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful people, and welcome to another episode of Art of the Beholder, a show dedicated to all things eclectic in the world of art, where we do deep dives into deep cuts and help you understand why damn things matter. I'm your host, Novo Day, and today we're going to be talking about art in history, focusing on the art movement, art movement that is avant-garde, with of course a hint of Dadaism and a pinch of Andy Warhol to top it all off in the dish, as the latter, in my humble opinion, acts as a kind of bridge to what came before it and to what came after. So that is modernism, postmodernism, and what it's often called today, neo-modernism, all the way to what we have at this very time, which is in our digital era. To hash things out, I am joined by our executive, exclusive senior contributor, the OG himself, my favorite soup can, Theodore the Buck, or T. Buck, as you usually know him. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Buck. Hola. Hello. Como estas? Let's do this. I'm back. Yes. Been a, been a minute. Been a minute. Good to see you. International to, man of mystery. I know. Uh, <laughs> I know. He travels I, across the world, and I have to pin him down with shackles to do these shows with me. And you know what I'm going to do for you before we start? I'm going to start with the T-Buck Tangent Corner. Mm. Because, oh yeah, si- uh, Curveball didn't see this coming. No. Because, you know what? We need to... Um, There's an elephant in the room. Oh. Uh, historians and musicologists, sociologists, the people that designed the nomenclature for this, why on earth did you call it modernism? Because by definition, everything that evolves and is in present time will be eventually the most modern thing. But they decided to call the era after avant-garde modernism. And because because now it's going to be really dated and we have to still call that modernism in the past. I, I, <laughs> like, what were you thinking? So on the pre-show, we were talk- yeah, we were talking about this and I was like, I had this, this like vision or view in my head of what avant-garde is. And then I came out being like, what? It like, changed so dramatically. It changed. Yeah. yeah so it's, it's well, interesting. We did our homework. Yeah. It's really interesting how people paint very broad brushes with everything. When things like this come up, I'm always like, well, what other things have we totally misconceptualized or we think is one thing, but isn't, you know? (laughs) So, I mean, it it brings up, it's going into like, (laughs) you're having a little bit of an existential crisis. And then like, you're you're just starting to try to think about like, what the hell is going on here? But I I think what, what, but then they doubled down and they they called it postmodernism. I was just like right after modernism. Let's call it postmodernism. Talk about like these people, like, (laughs) And 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 maybe we fall into this category. I I, I watched a film, early. so it, it like I I was like I got in like I had like a, a way deep thought. Ex- I was actually going to call you. Ooh, it. it was like yeah, hold hold night. that deep thought yeah. experiment. Let's let's save that to the discussion section yeah. because we got to tell the good people why we're talking about. Yeah, this we thing. haven't even got to the meat of the discussion. Yet. We <laughs> we the ears the are thesis. are flying everywhere. Oh no, it's good. It's good. It, ooh, yeah. it, it, we're getting the yeah. rust off. Getting the. Yeah. I had to stretch. I don't want to pull a hammy. Well, so why are we talking about this to today? Uh, we yeah. wouldn't have a lot of the artwork we have today, especially in the West, and most importantly in America specifically. America. Then, uh, of course, and then back to the world. If it wasn't for the movement that is avant-garde, mm-hmm. so a concept that is still readily used to this day. Now, this is where it gets complicated because it overlaps with a large variety of the arts and other art movements for almost 200 years now. Now, um, I wanted to talk about it because this is kind of, we are kind of wrapping up a three-part series of art history. We started with surrealism, then we went to art or abstract expressionism, and Mm -hmm. then uh, I wanted to talk about avant-garde because this this kind of art, avant-garde, and all of its subgenres, and all of all of the all the things under the umbrella, is what we cover so much in our show you mm-hmm. know and i think understanding the roots of it was is so important for not only us we learned a lot but our audience of of course so we need to talk about avant-garde but before we discuss of course we all need a little background so avant-garde literally means the advance guard or vanguard it was a concept that began in france in the 19th century developing roughly in the 18th 50s. So the French military used the term avant-garde 
or advanced guard as to identify a reconnaissance unit who scouted the terrain ahead of the main force of the army. So artists use this because they said to the to the people, we're going to go, we're going to be on the front lines for you. We're going to push boundaries. We're going to change ideas, create thought provoking and provocative subject matter to make you think and evolve into what the world can be for the future. That's what these artists were saying, right? And this is where it gets complicated. And me and T-Buck had a challenging time framing this because avant-garde is not only an umbrella term, it's Mm -hmm. also, it can be used as a noun and an adjective. And so all the historians love to, again, fuck guys, lock it up, get it together. Lock it up, get it together, man. We need better nomenclature because what they would do is they would talk about the avant-garde of the past and use the exact same terminology for the future So and as a movement. So we would get often lost, and I had to really figure out, wait, is this a chicken and the egg scenario, or what are they trying to do? So how we're going to frame it today is we're going to give those historians some nomenclature. So when we talk about the avant-garde of the past, we're talking about, so we just say avant-garde, we're talking about Europe, France, the West, and how, when it, you know, migrated to the Americas, the United America. States of America, America, America. <laughs> blue cats, um, Big blue cats from outer space. I haven't seen it yet. Folks. I haven't seen it yet, but I know I got, I, I, we need to go on a mandate and watch that goddamn movie. But oh, yeah, we, so, that, we saw it together. We saw the original uh, yeah. <laughs> Avatar together <laughs> and nerded out and had a great time. Uh, we had the nachos. Those and, were the, um, that was the theater that had a mandate. The, uh, it was AMC. Yeah but, yeah. but it was the theater that had, instead of the like normal 3D glasses, they were like scuba goggles. Oh, and yeah. They're huge. Them on, they were, it was almost kind of hard to watch. We were, we, we I think were we took it off after a while. So hard <laughs> because it looked, you, you and I looked at each other and we're like, what the fuck is going on here? And like everybody's wearing like these scuba goggle things in the theater and we were laughing. It so was hard fun. I thought it was a fun experience. Fun, fun film. Man, that uh, was back in the experience. day. Experience. But let's pull it back. Let's do a Novo pullback. So when we're talking about avant garde um, with no other identifiers we're talking about the avant-garde of the past we're talking Mm -hmm. about what it evolved to in the earliest 20th century and when eventually exploded into the middle of the 20th century and on into the 80s and 90s we're talking about what i call neo avant-garde or avant-garde americana since a lot of it exploded eventually once it got here and then went back to the rest of the world to of course um further inspire them to make to make new things. So it can be categorized as a person, a work, or reflecting the movement itself, often classified as experimental, radical, or or unorthodox, pushing the boundaries of the status quo and asking for radical social reform, usually in respect to the obvious, the arts, culture, and society. So they want, the avant-gardists wanted to use art as an instrument for social change. Now we can't talk about how it evolved without talking about Dadaism. So after it came from France and kept heading west and eventually got to America, we got the earliest version of avant-garde as an entire movement, okay? And that is with Dadaism. So this is a, a early 20th century, 1920s, and what evolved from them with this group of intellectuals and artists and political thinkers called the Situationists, roughly between 1957 until they dissolved in 1972. So Dadaism was an art movement of the European avant-garde, as already stated. They rejected logic, reason, and aestheticism of modern capitalistic society, instead Mm. expressing nonsense, irrationality, and anti-bourgeoisie protests in their works. So they were, um, this is often called anti-art because they're anti-war, and then that evolved into the American version of that, which we're going to focus on today with neo-avant-garde with anti-capitalism, essentially. And this is, you know, we, I think this is a perfect place to end our kind of three part series on art history because again avant-garde has evolved into being this nomenclature to describe a lot of different things and in surrealism you know a lot of surrealist artists were (laughs) avant-garde and that emerged you know from that era that emerged cubism and collage art and abstract art and futurism and of course 
expressionism and then a- abstract expressionism, how we got it in the West in New York City as its hub with Pollock and other guys like that. And um, that's where, just to give you a brief history on the situationists themselves, so this was an international organization of social revolutionaries made up of avant-garde artists, as already stated, intellectuals, and political theorists. Now, how do we get to define how all of that evolved with what I'm calling neo-avant-garde? I'm actually using the working definition model that they used for music because in the early, 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 and this is the avant-garde like absolutists, they were completely against capitalism and using something like, you know, financial success as a marker uh, for artistic value. You know, they didn't, yeah. they, they made it very clear. It's like, it doesn't matter how much money this makes. That's not the, the money it's not it makes about from it is the not money. the value. Yeah. I'm an artiste. So neo avant-garde is it, it refers to any form of art working within traditional structures while seeking to breach boundaries in the same manner. So what a lot of these artists found was this perfect intersection. And this is what to this day, I try to do this perfect intersection between the eccentric, the strange, a la the avant-garde, that's why we still use it to this day, and what is, you know, more easily digestible to to the masses, what what people can can actually get into without without being so strange that it pushes them away. And I think there is a perfect intersection of those two worlds. How do we make something unique, innovative, different? make you think push you know boundary pushing all of those things but also in this very contained product that does sell you know and that can get to a lot of people and help their lives in so many different ways you know it it could be from making them think about their lives differently or change how they think about things or just enjoying it and that's what i think the modern version of avant-garde has evolved Two, and that started roughly in the 1930s in America, exploded in the 1960s, and then went all the way to the 80s and 90s until modernism. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Now, before we hatch it out, of course, we all need a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by rehabilitation program Parrot Head Relief. So it's not just a GoFundMe page for T-Book anymore. It is now a complete rehab resort to get you Back to square one. So have you found yourself at the bottom of a margarita? Have you had one too many cheeseburgers in paradise? Are you still worshiping? Are you still worshiping Jimmy Buffett as a god? Uh, Well, let us tell you, stop it. We want to help you. And to do so, we want to get you out from rock bottom back to your life. So go to parrotheadrelief.com. That's one word. And sign up today and get your life back. Now, back to the show. So, um, like I said, in the intro, in the background section, we're going to start with how it exploded in, in, in America in the 1930s and how it really hit the mainstream, or I guess it started in the 1930s, excuse me, and really exploded mm-hmm. into the mainstream in the 1960s. So they, you know, it was first anti-war and then it turned into anti-capitalism. And it's, it's, uh, fascinating to look at the history because they eventually became so famous for wanting to push away from being famous <laughs> yeah and then they became famous it, it, well oh god i won't go down this so yeah they wanted to oppose mainstream cultural values too yeah you know often with trench and social political edges so the they were challenging the social and cultural values that was apparent in american culture as it expanded due to the idea of mass culture in the 1960s and that was um you know that so with the rise of the culture industry mm-hmm. very very uh, important to note, it was displaced by artistic a- excellence in favor of sales figures as a measure of artistic value, as already stated. So they wanted to push against that. You know, they yeah. were so push against the grain, sick and tired, so sick and tired. I actually so, somebody quoted when they were talking about what the movement really was. I, ooh, I thought it was ooh, a cool give quote. it to me. Yeah, um, they said it wasn't necessarily they were trying to go against the grain or go against you know mainstream. It was they were trying to depict what really was going on in reality in real life. Sure, um, you know, kind of instead of the kind of whitewashed, kind of sterilized version that we got. And you could think a lot, especially post World War II in the U.S. at least, 
Yeah, you, you kind of think of the suburban lifestyle, the leave it to beaver, the, you know, what people think is the good old f- home, like family America. I family. think they felt constrained by those ideas and values. And again, traditionalism. So they wanted to make something anti traditionalist. Remember, folks, these were boomers. <laughs> boomers used to be kind of cool and then they, they got old. <laughs> um, there's st- some of them are still cool. You know? Bernie's cool. <laughs> they're still Sorry, yeah just... they're still cool and what exploded from that mentality that those yeah. ideas that progressive isms was all these forms of art that again is so fascinating to us because as an amateur musicologist it it was such a clear uh dichotomy of of overlapping idealisms when art um when Art changes culture, and when culture changes art. Let's start with the art first, Hmm. and then we'll go to the culture. So, you know, all of this started in traditional fine art, so we need to talk about what those definitions entailed. So the aestheticisms of traditional fine art on a canvas or what have you is artwork that redefines artistic conventions, if it utilizes new artistic tools and techniques, and if it redefines the nature of the art objects themselves. Question here. Because you're more of the expert on this. (laughs) So we're talking about, especially with aesthetics, and then if we go back like to the late 19th century aestheticism. Yes. Sometimes that's even considered avant-garde because that movement was going against, again, against the grain where it was more about making something pretty. Yeah, like the surrealists. Surrealists. or, Or like even somebody painting a portrait of like a you know, a pretty scene or like a serene thing with people in it. That's not religious. That has no religious <laughs> affiliation to it. Sure. Cause remember that was, that drove a lot Renaissance and like a lot of art, like work was totally driven by the church or like, or, you know, kind of had that, those sort of themes. So it wanted to be, it wasn't just anti-war and anti-capitalism. It was anti-traditionalism's, within culture you know yeah people hated the idea and this is this is where the art eventually turned into the culture when we get i'm getting a little ahead of myself but when we get to counter culture culture and um you know other other things like that which led to the civil rights movement hippie culture punk culture of the 1970s and of course sex and drug revolutions so that's when it poured over into you know, people were so inspired by this art and how non-conforming it was that they wanted to do it in their everyday life and pursuit of life and idea of life. And I think, again, we owe a huge debt to them. We, we take it for granted that this was such an explosion of ideas at this very finite time in history. It was only 60 years ago, but what they did then really changed the entire landscape of the culture we have today. You know, with trans rights and gay rights and, you know, um, more rights for minorities and things like that. Before we get there, of course, we we really do need to focus on why it evolved that way with the arts itself, Mm -hmm. because the main there's four main types of um, when when we talk about avant garde as a movement again, you know, so this is this is past Europe. We're already in America. It's the 1930s going into the 1950s and 60s before it really exploded. Yeah, and we have, this. yeah, and we have Dadaism, which we already okay. talked about, and that eventually turned into abstract expressionism, which we talked about in our other episode. And then uh, something we we have touched on a lot, and I think we both love, especially in a music format of the arts, oh, yes. is minimalism. Mm-hmm. Yep. We love minimalism. We love, love you it. Know, guys like Philip Glass and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, that evolved into pop art. So, so let's break a lot of these down. Um, and obviously, we have other shows that are dedicated to something like abstract expressionism. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that. And we already talked about Dadaism. And, um, but I think a perfect example, if someone doesn't want to go through all the fucking text like we did and just wants like one perfect example of how something that's very ordinary is redefined into something artistic is that is with Marcel's Marcel Duchamp's The Fountain in 1917, which was all it was, was a urinal that was placed on its (laughs) side and signed R. Mutt. When I first saw that, I thought it was something like very much more modern than 19. I was actually shocked 
I, I've seen it before, but I didn't realize. Well, they're it was always ahead anything. of their time artists, yeah, yeah. right? It's always yeah, future like, thinking, and he did that. He, for back then, yeah, for very much so. So he redefined yeah. artistic conventions by taking an item like this, like a urinal that was that was already made, and employing the item uh, or redefining it for artistic purpose. And I think this is the birth. You know, we've made you know as much as we are a highbrow show, mm-hmm. uh, we we do take a minute to criticize um, the the arts in and of themselves, you know, a lot of it can be sometimes kind of pretentious and silly. And we, I think we have a good um, balance of uh, making fun of them where they need to be made fun of it or really praising them and, and uh, glorifying, glorifying different things. And I think this is a perfect example of um, the birth of like people saying, Oh, my fucking kid could do that kind of art. Yeah. The, the, the example that keeps popping up in my head when I think of the fountain and stuff like that, that was the 1917 version of somebody duct taping a banana Banana to a wall. wall. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, this was the birth of like, well, my fucking kid could do that. But again, when you dive into the history, the context of why they're doing it, why they're trying to say this can be artistic or, or just making, you know, I know it's such a simple thing and it's a silly thing. It is, you know, on paper, but it really can re remold how you think about everything right like this yeah. isn't just a urinal this is an art piece and then you you could look at you i know it's, it's again it's such a weird thing to to redefine but then you, when i think a lot of these artists or a lot of the people that came out after the dadaists started looking at the world around them and realizing we are surrounded by art pieces everywhere and oh, i feel like yeah. the floodgates opened it's it's especially when you talk about photography as a medium of course you can have you could do abstract photography or do art photography. You know, you things are you have set pieces where people, you know, you take photography or use different things or mm-hmm. um, to kind of make it purposely abstract. But then, if you look at nature and the environment, you could you can also just modify just just our everyday lives or things we see every day, like buildings or chairs or th- something like that. Exactly. You know kind of just framing it just how you frame things you know you could definitely get a very different um, perspective Mm -hmm. of how you see the world so and that evolved into abstract expressionism Mm -hmm. which had action painting things like that uh you know click here to see our other episode and then of course people see what's great about this movement is that people would push back within the movement at the so when it started creating subgenres and different and and subgenres from those sub, sub subgenres, they would push back on themselves to create even new things. And people started to push back on the abstract expressionism, the big, loud, violent pieces. They wanted minimalism. There's literally a piece in, I think, still to this day, in I believe it's a museum in Russia that is just a black square on a yeah. like a very specific mm-hmm. canvas or framed a certain way to give it some uniqueness. But anybody can make a black square. Why is this one so important, right? And again, yeah. it has to do with the time, what they were pushing against. Um, so the culture and history are so important with the timing of art. I think that's an important subthesis to our main thesis today. And then, of course, that exploded into um, really the apex of the the movement in America, the neo-avant-garde, and that is pop art, that subgenre. And this is where we bring in kind of the unofficial uh, the unofficial leader leader of the avant-garde movement, and that is Andy Warhol. Yeah. So um, Andy Warhol, if you don't know, if you've been living under a fucking uh, rock, is you know the artist behind the soup can pieces in 1962, the various Marilyn Monroe pieces in 1962. Um, but he was, you know, what's great about Warhol is he was I think he's such a a model for something like an, a career that I want and he's so he's so aspirational and inspirational because he didn't he was really an artist that did so many different things. Yeah, it's it's like Dolly. I mean, it, it's sometimes it's more not necessarily about the art, but it's more about the the personality, the person, really. Right. Cuz like I, I mean, the other one that still cracks me up and I don't know why, but it's it's the one where he's eating a cheeseburger. <laughs> I mean, in it's, paradise. It, yeah. It, well, it, 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 hey. 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 Yeah. Now. Hey. Now. Hey, oh, hey, wait, let's, I, let's, I, I'm triggering him. I'm opening up old tra- wounds. I'm. But like, let's. I mean, let's. I'm gonna go through the. I'm gonna do a lightning round. I mean, he did. He did paintings. 
He did uh, films. He he yeah. he helped uh, produce music. He did books. I mean, this guy did a little of everything, and I I find that you know so. I mean, this is obviously he had points of uh, you know spikes in where he was most famous, and a lot of his most famous stuff was the traditional art pieces the traditional fine art pieces that were in this movement you know with the the soup cans and the and the uh Marilyn. i actually have a print of of one of his Marilyn monroe's that i have hung up I in my seen, in my yeah. my studio so a modern example would somebody like this is overused a lot but banksy yes absolutely absolutely he's pushing against uh you know but he's he's doing it in the in Obviously, and again, click here for our for episode on Banksy. Uh, yeah, but yeah, he's doing the exact same thing. He's pushing, he's pushing back on conventions, on artistic conventions, and 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 how they affect culture because like he's a been fairy, yeah, 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 because he's been he's been what anti capitalism, anti a million of these things. But I think you know what? I'm glad you brought up Banksy because yeah. he is another example of how what's crazy is that in the complete traditional you know again absolutist definition of avant-garde that they were actually against any kind of you know monetary gain as artistic value they all became incredibly famous from pushing back so much that they just kind of leaned into it and that's where i feel like this is the apex of when the neo avant-garde really started and it it said i think it said to artists you know it's it's okay to be famous and it's okay to be financially successful and that you know and the and the rest is history kind of a thing from in terms of just that in terms of that that intersection of you know well, we don't have to push back on and you know we can push back and make people think and, and then have all these you know counterculture movements and things like that but you know what I, why, why don't we lean into this thing make our voices bigger make our platform bigger and better and yeah. you know you know it's okay kind of thing so I was happy to see that with uh, the beginning of Andy Warhol and celebrity culture and things like that. And this is the guy that made that coined the most famous phrase that we still have really to this day, especially with our our modern, you know, social media culture, TikTok culture, Instagram culture. And that is the 15 minutes of fame. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, people are just famous for like either no reason looking pretty or like, yeah, I mean, or <laughs> the TikTok one just it, it still baffles me. And and I'm sounding like old man yelling at a cloud right now, but get off my lawn, <clears throat> get off my, get off my lawn. Uh, <laughs> you know, just like you see some of these that they're just famous for doing like little dance. They did dances in front of a camera, like, you know, five years ago. Now they're making millions of dollars. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it is uncanny. I mean, yeah, a lot of people get their 15 minutes of fame and, and, and the smart ones, of course, hang on to that fame and yeah, yeah. monetize it. And yeah, they're, you know, doing yeah tiktok dances like literally Memes nothing and, for yeah. for fame and money and they're and they're like you know just putting this sponsor in the background it's like oh that person likes that thing i should buy that thing and that, yeah and of course people think that that's just a coincidence but those companies are telling them to put that there or they're to, telling or them to, to wear it. this outfit or whatever so they it's very it's like it's like invisible sponsorship it's the same thing that's been going on for decades forever it's forever in marketing yeah into yeah, and that's the thing the best marketing is subliminal like you don't actually know you're being marketed to yeah when you're watching even a show like or movies or the office you know you, you'll always see like there are product placements in there that are, you know, specifically so you can see the logo. Uh, exactly. One of my favorite ones is in the social network where there's a scene where he's talking about he doesn't want to, ha- you know, sell ads and make money off of Mountain Dew. And he's drinking Mountain Dew and it's perfectly <laughs> it's perfectly placed in the frame so you can see the logo there. I exactly. Mean, yeah, stuff like that. Anyway. So yeah, from this era of avant-garde, this evolved into a lot of different things. You know, it had its its tentacles ran deep into music and theater and film. And like again, when I think of the unofficial, you know, perfect example of my head in when it comes to the avant-garde movement, I, I would always go to Andy Warhol for pop music and just the the fine art category. When I think of music, I always think of the Velvet Underground. And oh, the yeah. Velvet Underground and Nico. And then of course Lou Reed at Transformer. And that eventually evolved into the work of Tom Waits and Frank Love Zappa. It. And of course we already talked about Philip Glass and, and the um classical, you know, genre. Mm-hmm. And that of course then influenced the the jazz scene at the time. So Ornette 
Ornette Coleman, Sun Ra, Albert Eiler, Archie Shep, John Coltrane, of course, Miles Davis. There's even modern examples, too. Like, if we want to keep moving, like, rock or metal. I mean, I, I was telling you I was listening to Mr. Bungle before. Mm, <laughs> that's right, yeah. You yeah, said you wanted to get into the get into your flow. Yeah, well, no, and and it's it's very different, and it's more. I mean, again, you could probably consider this more experimental. I, I was thinking hip hop, like one guy I was thinking it was a JPEG Mafia or some somebody sure. like that. But I mean, you know, classically to me, it's always I've always associated more with jazz. So like, I just think of Coltrane and Miles Davis. Yeah, bitches brew and a love bitches supreme brew. Still one of the coolest. Uh, Sun Ra. Yusuf. Cover art, Mahavishnu Orchestra, Can, yeah. Yusuf, Latif is not Yusuf as a cat. So. Yeah, I feel like the music, okay. Mingus. the music, like, Age of weather Enlightenment report. was here. Oh, yeah, Weather yeah. Report. I mean, I feel like the list is pretty vast. And what's cra- crazy is that still a lot of people don't know who they are, which is why we have a show dedicated to these kind of yeah. acts and things like that. And then, of course, that evolved into the, the theater you know, uh, to the medium that is theater with uh, pieces like the automobile graveyard, the tricycle, the labyrinth. Of course, this would eventually trickle into traditional film, motion pictures. I I always think of David Lynch as a good marker for avant-garde. You know, to this day, a lot of his pieces are just so hard to consume. You know, my go-to is the one I grew up with, of course, is Mulholland Drive. And um, we see, I think that is actually a good, we'll get here, you know, kind of in the conclusion section. I think, I feel like the the neo avant-garde as we know it as today, when we're still calling things avant-garde, I think the biggest still uh, flex of that artistic community is, is in film. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, maybe even, well, I don't know. Terrence Malick was one thing another sure. person i thought of um yeah you, you yeah it definitely is the biggest flex because it's it's a it's not just i i think when we're talking about films sometimes it, it could be a mixture of things it could be awesome music too because that's part of it as well but uh visually you know i i think yeah that's i, I agree with you that's probably the biggest flex out there for <laughs> And so all of this art, as already stated, affected like profoundly. I feel like I have a hard time really refuting any other point in uh, modern history for how profound an effect this art movement had on culture. I can't think Mm -hmm. of any other time when it was this profound. And that is when um, it seeped into the counterculture movement, which wanted to revolutionize how we looked at human sexuality and women's rights and traditional modes of authority and rights of non-white people, uh, end of racial segregation, experimentation with, you know, psychoactive drugs and just a differing interpretation of the American dream was very important. I think that exploded here at this time, 60s, 70s, 80s, more than more than ever. And again, we owe them an incredible debt for the civil rights movement, even a little bit of hippie culture, punk culture of the 1970s, and of course, the sex and drug revolutions. And that kept evolving into eventually, yeah. you know, into modernism, what we what we actually, me and Buck grew up with in the 90s, and neo uh, postmodernism, neo modernism, all the way into what we have today. But I think that's the that's the most important thing about this whole topic Teenage is that Ninja Turtles. <laughs> she, that you know, as as um as silly as, th- as that is on paper, it, it you know the original comics were kind of trippy and psychedelic. Oh, yeah. and that's like another you know, show. Yeah, yeah, I Red know Letter we've talked about it before, but yeah, and Red Letter Media just did a whole thing on it. Um, go check that out with with actually one of the comic book artists that's kind of been famous for doing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics. So yeah, and I, my point being is that you know as much as the the art movement as a movement kind of just started to fade away into the the to the later eighties, I would say, um, and that went into modernism in the nineties. There is a little bit of a renaissance that we have since probably 2000, I want to say eight or nine, where a lot of people, and that's why we still, and and myself included, I still use the term avant-garde to describe a lot of things that are trying to push the boundaries. And yeah, I mean, we have versions of that in alternative, but I feel like alternative was still like its own thing. Because out of modernism came grunge music and things like that. And then that turned into alternative. 
And then it's almost, you know, these things are cyclical. You know, I feel like we're seeing a lot of avant-garde. And that's where I wanted to kind of end the discussion before we went to the conclusions and the gems is um, kind of how it has come round circle. And again, a lot of the contemporary examples that I see are in film with, you know, we've done a whole piece on uh, Denis Villeneuve, who has done, you know, countless film epics, you yeah. know, with Arrival and Blade Runner and Dune. Dune, and they are very avant-garde because it is a perfect union of subject matter and stories and storytelling and art blocking and, and camera movement and all the things that make filmmaking filmmaking. It's very unique. It's very art house. Um, it's it's very avant-garde, but it also is, it can still reach a large audience. It's still yeah. easily digestible as forward-thinking and innovative and, and eccentric and strange as it may be at times. There's still enough for people, the door is open enough for people to get in and really enjoy it for entertainment purposes. So Yeah, I think like something like Enemy is probably from him. Oh yeah, that's probably the most, the you most. know, on that spectrum, yeah. the most avant-garde where that was that was probably leaning a little more on the non-digestible, I think it's still hard for audiences to get into that film. But mm-hmm. um, we, but we see that with a lot of filmmakers. I've, I would I would argue Tarantino. You know, even though Tarantino's kind of you know getting close to the end of his career, you know, he was a lot of his pieces were very avant-garde. You know, yeah, easily was, digestible, but still strange enough to be very artistic. Yeah, almost on that pop pop art spectrum because it, so much of it is surrounding like nineteen seventies. Uh, you know, it, a lot of like exploitation films, or um, but it's like a fusion of kung all fu. those things. Yeah, like yeah. a fusion of these things that he loved growing up that were kind of considered. Some of it was considered art, but some of it was considered more like kind of like B or like you know midnight movie type things, or or just kind of just that whole pop culture of that time. What are some of your What are some of your examples that you were thinking of for the show? Yeah, so I, I was actually thinking in other mediums too, like comedy. Ooh, please, um, yeah. I, anti-humor, especially. I, I think. Oh yeah, Tim and Eric really. You put anti in front of anything, and that's kind of avant-garde in a way. Yeah, and I, I think like Tim and Eric are probably the best example in the past twenty years I can think of because a lot of people, if you watched, especially the old Tim and Eric shows, I, I've actually I. I don't know if it, I would call it a mistake, but a lady I was dating at the time, I, I had her watch one of the episodes with me and I'm like <laughs> laughing and she's like, what you is told wrong me about with this. you? Yeah. I think we talked about this on air. on a Oh, did we? Oh, okay. Yeah. It's okay. Um, we can talk about it again. But it, yeah. Anyway, I, I, I was laughing. Well, so hard. I think I even put myself in that camp because it is so anti-humor that I have a hard time getting into it myself. Well, is, it, and I'm into a lot of this stuff. And not just Tim and Eric. I mean, Tim Heidecker as a whole and him and uh, Greg Turkington. I mean, I, we've talked about this, I know for sure. They they have a fake movie review show, kind of like Siskel and Ebert, that's lasted for 12 years. <laughs> no and shit. the universe that they've created a universe that rivals any of the larger, like, you know, when we think Marvel or, I mean, just how complex it is. It's not that complex. It's, it's very funny. But if you watched it at first, you're like, what? What the hell are they what talking is about? Yeah. Why is he talking about grain water drinking this water? Or like, why is he talking about these uh, vapes that help? I mean, I mean, it's all it's not only is it a commentary on pop culture, it's also like things that are happening, you know, at that time, whether it's like mid these mid uh, multi-level marketing schemes or anything like that, or, or you kind of, kind of like QAnon even. And we're talking about a movie review, sh- a, a, sh- a fake movie review show. And you still have one guy that's like sits there and eats popcorn the whole time and just wants to talk about his VHS collection. It, I To me, it is still the one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen in my life. I can't get anybody into it because it takes dedication. Oh, but yeah. that's but that's like that is a great example to me of avant garde almost this this kind of anti humor. And you don't really get it until you get the joke. And I know there's a lot of other examples out there. But to me, that's. That's the one uh, with, with comedy. I think you, you still see it in film. I think even in technology a little bit, I, I think of Vine. Mm, Vine yeah. to me, I, and I know that's a weird example, but that is an interesting, and the, for the people that have forgotten, tell what, tell them what Vine yeah, is. So, before so there was TikTok, there was there, Vine. Before there's TikTok, it's kind of like the precursor to it, but to me, it's the exact same thing. It just didn't have the. It, it doesn't the, have the, the marketing platform. You no, know? Yeah. I, well, I think the biggest was the six. It didn't get as famous as much. Yeah. So 
it was basically a video. Uh, it was precursor to TikTok, but it had a six second restriction. So the videos could only be six seconds long. So in does a TikTok weird way, has no restrictions like that, or it does. Well, they. I think it used to be like thirty seconds. They've they've expanded on that because the videos are a lot longer now. Some can do it, okay. but but it, it, it. And I when it first came out, I was like, what the hell? Like it doesn't. It, and they were trying to make it kind of like a visual. Twitter. I still watch fine compilations of this. Oh, day. I do. Like some of them that are like gold, like just because like, great. The constraints is what made it either funny or interesting. You had to get something out, and the, the comics, the comedic value of it. Like the most famous one is the little girl looking at a whole bunch of ducks or geese, and she goes, "Look at all these chickens." And it's cute the way she says it, but it's also no, they're not chickens. Chickens, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> I still say that to my wife. Every, I do too. to this day. I still just will like look at all these chickens. chickens. She says it so. Yeah, like the other a funny one I saw. Yeah, well, that's another thing. But anyway, I think some of that because that's that was so out of left field. Like, you, but it, but it, it, it really. There's a lot of famous people from Vine today from that oh yeah yeah and they it, created a lot of uh definitely we talked about this in the pre-show youtuber culture and youtuber yeah. um or a lot of careers. youtubers were former viners i mean yeah, that exactly. became famous so but those restrictions it 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 basically jump a lot of different creativity like the way people thought about things and some of it's part of their culture but i i think about this a lot in avant-garde and like doing something different or 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 living within the constraints that you have and and that also kind of like making you more and think differently and become even more creative. I mean, the, uh, I mean, film too, uh, like in jaws, they couldn't get the shark to work. So they didn't show the shark hardly ever, but that's what made it scary. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's just like things like that. It, it's kind of expanding and trying new things. Oh, I, I definitely think, and I think we'll continue to see a renaissance for the avant-garde and those movements and pushing boundaries and, and creating a lot of, you said it best, anti-forms of art, anti-this, yeah. anti-that. And we're even seeing, like, just to bring it around circle before we, before we get out of here, is Tide we're bone. seeing a lot of the art pieces that were big back then be sold for an incredible amount of money oh, yeah. right now because the biggest guy right now that you know he didn't he was probably a little bit in the shadow of Warhol and that's because that's why he didn't probably get as much recognition then but he's getting it now is Jean Michel Basquiat mm, yeah and a lot of his pieces are just fucking selling like hotcakes and there was a whole there was a whole controversy because a lot of people were making fakes of them you know like really like perfectly constructed fakes and then of course selling those for millions of dollars so i urge you guys to look into this stuff because i think you'll learn a lot of where we are today through it so let's bring it on home tie a bow on this bee mr buck tell the good people why they should study the history of avant-garde well i think you know you can make parallels on, on, <laughs> with avant-garde even with kind of human history as a whole in society i'm not going to get that deep here but i i, I think why it's important is it, it kind of proves a point where doing something different and going against what the culture at that time you know may deem like kind of acceptable or or just thinking differently i mean i i know i'm pulling from an apple ad here but <laughs> I, I think there's a point in that is that you know, things that we think are strange and weird now and don't make sense may really influence a lot of people and may and think, they will <laughs> and it will. And it does make people really start to think different and it, it nurtures that creativity. So I, I think whenever that happens, especially amongst humans, I mean, look how it, it affects us in all different parts of our lives, whether it's we're talking about creativity, we're talking about technology, we want to have the types of scientific advances if we didn't have science fiction because an idea a thought something different influenced somebody to try to make that reality so i think that's part of this whole thing and kind of wrapping up these different this trilogy of art movements that we've looked at is that that's really important for us as a human you know a species in advancement is that we have people doing different things thinking outside of the box 
influencing us in life. And that just kind of pushes us further. And it's had profound effects making not only art better, but our culture better. And there you have it, guys. Thank you for listening. The history that is avant-garde from top to bottom. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank my guest, Mr. Buck. But before we go, you know, we got a little extra for you, a little icing on the cake, a little cherry on top with what we call the gym of the week. If you're new to the show and don't know what the gym of the week is, guys, come on, lock it up. We're like 60 episodes in. You should know what it is by now. But if you don't, that's okay. I'm going to tell you right now. It's something we like to talk about at the end of our shows that doesn't always fit into the scheme of the episode, but we want to give it to you nonetheless because it may be on our radar in the last day, last month, uh, maybe last week. I don't know, but we got to give it to you guys so you guys can dig yeah. deeper. Before we get there, of course, you need to hear from their sponsor. Gems this week are sponsored by Zencaster. Zencaster is our go-to tool for remote podcast recordings. What's great is that you can record separate audio and video tracks, and it's all backed up on a secured cloud, so you never lose your hard work. Even better, it's easy to use and there's nothing to download. So go to zen.ai, that's Z-E-N dot A-I slash Art of the Beholder, or just use promo code Art of the Beholder and get 30% off your first three months with the pro account. Now back to the gems. Me and my wife last night... Okay. Watched the Bollywood film RRR. Whoa. This has been in the fucking art community and or just just a little everywhere, even the non-art community. And this is this tale is bonkers. I've seen I've seen a little bit of of Bollywood films, clips here and there, short films, things like that. I have not sat through a full feature length motion picture. Okay. This was my first time. RRR, like the literal letters, mm-hmm. RRR, it is, it, the original title is from their native language of Telugu, Telugu which yeah. is, uh, the RRR st- stands for Rudram Ranam Rudhiram, which roughly trans- translates to Fierce Death Blood, which I kind of wish they used that title, but they knew they wanted to uh, release it to an international market, so they just used the letters RRR, and in the West, for English translations, those R's are for rise, roar, and revolt. Guys, thanks for listening. You know what to do. Like, subscribe, do all the things. Follow us at NovaDayProductions.com or at underscore Novo underscore Day and Days DE or at Novaday Media. If you'd like to sponsor our little love child, you can reach out to us at NovaDayMedia at gmail.com. You can also reach, us, reach out to us there if you want to be on the show. So until next time, be good to each other. And as always, good luck and Godspeed. We love you. Art of the Beholder is brought to you by Novo Day Productions, created and hosted by Novo Day and the Novo Day Collective. Facebook.com slash Novo Day Media, at Novo Day Media on Twitter and Instagram. Music by A Company, Facebook.com slash Aco Music 123, Aco on Spotify. Logo designed by Tom Justice, J E S T U S, of the Justice Company.com, and executively produced by Clayton Anderson. All rights reserved. Namaste.